You're going to love this. Hundreds of Macy's Cyber Week specials are here and ready for gifting online and in store. Like boots and booties for her, buy one, get one free. Mixers, air fryers, and more, 20% plus an extra 20% off. And find gifts for him and her, coats, sweaters, tops, 50 to 60% off. Macy's Cyber Week specials now through Wednesday. Savings off regular prices, exclusions apply. Macy's Star Rewards now offers benefits everyone can enjoy no matter how they pay. Sign up for free in store or at Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. Blog Talk Radio. There's a worldwide revolution going on. And in my opinion, the young generation of white, black, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution. What is it revolting against? The power structure. The American power structure? No. The French power structure? No. The English power structure? No. Then what power structure? An international Western power structure. And I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. There's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built, and the only way it's going to be built is with extreme methods. So what you and I have got to do is get involved. You and I have to be right there breathing down their throat. Every time they look over their shoulder, we want them to see us. Once those intentions are made known, we can get to the nitty-gritty of the problem. We can get to the core of the problem. We can get to the root of the problem. And then we can correct the problem. In the love audience, let us welcome you again to Light Upon Light, and our greeting, dearly beloved audience, is the human greeting of peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum. Let us move very, very swiftly, brought on by Brother Malcolm as he was transitioning from a super tribal leader to a leader of universal perspective. But he had not made the transition. So he had a limited perspective. Nevertheless, we love the brother. We appreciate the brother. And we ask the Creator to have mercy upon him, forgive him of his sins, and to pardon him of his transgressions, grant him the blessings of peace and paradise and save him from the torment of the hell fire. Dear beloved audience, let us pray for light, light upon light, we welcome you tonight, and and uh, in this week of Thanksgiving, we are so appreciative to be able to bring you from under the turbulence and the turmoil of a life where Turkey is the key. Turkey and all that stuff they put up there, Turkey, all that stuffing is the key to keeping us in a bad state. So we welcome you so we have the opportunity to share light upon light. This week of Thanksgiving, we so appreciate it, appreciative 
and surely the Creator quickly reward those who serve Him with gratitude and appreciation. And and the Creator loveth not the ungrateful wretch. So we're so happy during this week of Thanksgiving. I thought you were um, uh, one of those old Muslim brother. What you doing talking about Thanksgiving? You just heard me that the Creator say the Creator loves not the ungrateful wretch. But if we are thankful and appreciative and grateful, the Creator loves us. So there's nothing wrong with celebrating the concept of gratitude and appreciation to the Creator first and then to all of creation. We can celebrate the idea of the principle of thanksgiving and gratitude and appreciation. Dearly beloved audience, we got without allowing our appetites to get caught up in the trappings of Thanksgiving unchecked by knowledge. Now, it's, it's all right to eat that turkey, that cranberry sauce, and that stuffing. If we're not blindly and unconsciously being led by our appetites unchecked by knowledge. Yes, when I uh, 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 eat the turkey, I understand consciously. This presenter understand consciously why they call it a turkey. T-U-R is the key to giving the donkey a life of T-U-R, turmoil, T-U-R, turbulence. Terror is the key for keeping the donkey in bad shape. Let us pray for light. O Creator, make light in our hearts, light in mine eye, light in mine ear, light on my right, light on my left. Light above me, light before me, light behind me, make thou for me light. Light in my tongue, light in my sinews, light in my flesh, light in my blood, light in my hair, light in my body, light in my soul. Magnify for me light. O Creator, bestow upon me light. I'm a Jim Crow fella. Southern born and bred. And I was a little bitty thing. And my people used to be singing, This little light of mine... I'm going to let it shine. And they will say, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. You better believe, when dearly beloved audience, when you tune into light upon light, this presenter is going to let this light shine. Going to let it shine. Not just here on light upon light, but everywhere this presenter goes, he let this light shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Dearly beloved audience, the Creator has created his excellent human being with the nature to want to seek light, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. The first commandment in Bible, the Genesis, get some light, man, get some knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in your head. Come out of ignorance. The first 
revelation to Muhammad during the night of power in the darkness of the cave. The first revelation was Muhammad Reed. Get some knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So the Creator has created us to have a natural curiosity for light, a natural excellent desire for light, knowledge a light is the lost property of the believers. We are to seek knowledge, a light from the cradle to the grave. Oh yes. Seek knowledge from the seek light. Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. We never outgrow our need for light from the book of revealed cosmic science. Oh we're so grateful. We are so thankful for light upon light. The creator is the light of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light as if there were a niche and within it a lamp. The lamp enclosed in glass. The glass as it were, a brilliant star lit from a blessed tree. And I live neither the east nor the west, whose all is well nigh luminous, though fire scarce touch it. The light upon light, the Creator do set forth parables for men, and the Creator do Know all things. Dear beloved audience, you're listening to the miracle of a donkey speaking with a man's voice. We're living in the day, the end of a global paradigm of materialism is identified in the Genesis as a serpent licking the dust of the earth. Not a physical serpent, but the beginning of the creation of what would go grow and 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 as is depicted in Revelation as a giant reptile. Materialism, the paradigm now is global. And this Small reptile has grown into a dragon, drowning in a lake of fire, grown into Godzilla. Zilla means, is a biblical term, one of the wives of Lamech. And it, it means shadow of darkness. And these diabolic minds are bragging, we are the God of God. You no, know, you're not a God. You're not a God. You are a deviant creation, a rebellious creation. You're not a God. Don't flatter yourself. Godzilla, God of darkness. And no, Lucifer did not have a fight with the Creator. Lucifer fights you. Lucifer assaults you. Lucifer come up against you from your right, from your left, from your front and your back. Lucifer engages in all kinds of strategies and techniques of subliminal seduction to seduce you away from your Lord. And and the Archangel Michael did not fight with Lucifer and we had a third of the angels with him. No indeed. 
the angels do not have the faculty of freedom of will like the sons and daughters of Adam. No, angels can't rebel against the Creator. Only men and gen can rebel against the Creator. Oh, you believe that fool is that? That the earth was the war in the heavens, all right, but not with the Creator. And Lucifer too, and I met a gen who pretended to be angels. They were in the religious extravagance. Men, oh, they looked so holy. They looked so righteous like they were. Oh, beautiful angels. But when God tested them and said, look, I'm going to create Adam a ruler in the earth, these gen under the influence of Satan, reveal their true colors. They were only pretending to be angels. They thought they was righteous. <laughs> they thought they were all holy. But when the test came, came the cover was pulled off, and it was plainly visible that they were not angels. They were a bunch of rebellious gen under the influence of the shaitan. Dearly beloved audience, you're listening to the miracle of a donkey speaking with a man's voice. So we're living in the end of this global paradigm of materialism. That's why it's called the end times. We're living in, in, in the day of judgment where the creator is judging this global order of materialism. He's weighing it in the balancing uh is 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 being proven that is wanting. And that the handwriting did it beloved audience is on the wall. This is the day of conclusion. Inherently because this is the day of religion. And all the arguments and debates and religion are going to be concluded before this day and time is over. You better believe that. There's not several religions. There's uh, one creator, and he's given humankind two fathers. Our father Adam, and every righteous seer, visionary from every people on the planet that's not part of the Abrahamic dispensation, they come under God through Adam, Confucius, Buddha, Chief Seattle, and all these folk, the great Inca seers and visionaries and prophets, the great Aztecs, the great African visionary seers and prophets, even the European had visionary seers and prophets. They have there has been, according to law, 124,000 prophets sent to this planet. Some would say even more. And there's never been a people, there's never been a civilization that was not initiated by a prophet. Now, we know that Western civilization Dearly beloved audience, does not follow the teachings of Jesus in, in their in their purity. We know that, but they're telling you that this is a dead Christian civilization. That means we supposed to be under the influence of the prophets of the Jews. I mean, Ben Israel, Israel, the children of. Israel, and I'm with, I'm with Jesus, and John, the family of Imran, John, John the Baptist, and Zechariah. We're supposed to be up under that so Western civilization admit that it was uh, the work of Prophet Jesus. Even 
even though they distorted the work, they got the civilization going. There has never been a civilization. Once they get the knowledge of the prophet, the egotistical political leaders, the Pharaoh and, and his sorcerers, they try to act like they created the civilizational impulse. But they were the catalyst of the civilization impulse. No. They stole the work of the prophets and distorted it so they could oppress and manipulate and control the masses. The book say you saw something in 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 the word that was crooked. That's why the priest carried his staff. Dearly beloved audience called a crook. That's why the shepherds and they grab on the sheep with that 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 poorly sheep in with that crook. So yes, we're living in the end times, but it does not mean that cessational doomsday idea where everything is burned up, earthquakes, water everywhere. No. That's Hollywood sensationalism. That's not the reality, dearly beloved people, that the Creator has revealed. You're listening to the miracle of a donkey speaking with a man's voice. Dearly beloved audience, this donkey was born a few days before the assassination of Mahatma's Gandhi. January 30th, 1948. That's the year he that was the date he was assassinated. This donkey was born out in Port Bend in Georgia, January 1st, a little bit after midnight. In deep Jim Crowism, there were some nurses' aides around my mom, and they were encouraging her own to give birth to the first baby of the new year so that we could win the, the gifts, you know. Fort Benning gave gifts to the first baby born during the new year. And she pushed and pushed. And I was delivered right before this baby, they say, was the child of a Captain Fox who was Caucasian. That's what they say. I don't remember these events. And... They say they took my birth certificate. They didn't even uh, attempt uh, to eliminate the date by retyping a new one. They just took a pencil and struck through it and put a new date on there. That was a year when Dr. King was getting his high academic training in 1948 and left Morehouse, I think, and also the year that Malcolm Shabazz converted to the Nation of Islam. So that's the world this donkey was born into. In a kindergarten, I think, in the fall of 1954, a few months after the Supreme Court sent down a, a, a rendered the Brown versus Board of Education decision. A little while after they 
follow with Brown to all deliberate speed. So consequently, when this doctor graduated from high school in June of 1966, it was still in a Jim Crow context. Not one day did I attend so-called desegregated educational training in my hometown of Columbus, Georgia. My mom and dad neither finished elementary school. The people gave this donkey good grades, but the donkey still was in ignorance. Still was in ignorance. Graduated from high school, went to the University of Georgia. Eyes began to come open a little bit, but basically still a creature of the darkness. We saying all of this, dearly beloved audience, because we closing out 2018. We closing out on 100 years from 1918. We closing out 50 years from the tumultuous year in American history and even globally, 1968. We're getting ready to move into the 100th anniversary since the year 1919, the double 19, and the double 19 is 38, and 38 is 137, the number in physics of the fine structure constant, 137. The year 1919, may have been the most important year in the 20th century. We're getting ready to go into 2019, but don't expect for it to match the year later. 2020, the double 20. Like in 1919, we had the double 19. A century from now, we have the double 2021. Do you understand? So you get ready. We know that in 2020 we'll have another presidential election. We do know that. So you get ready, dearly beloved audience. And we're going to go Thanksgiving night as well if, if you tied up with family, that's understandable. But we getting ready for 1969 and we have to explain to you how this donkey eyes began to come open. In 1966, as I've said on other occasions, this donkey attended the University of Georgia. The way I got admitted to the University of Georgia was, in a sense, ethically problematic. So when I went, the way I got in, I didn't, I couldn't get in with a scholarship. What do I mean by ethically problematic? Well, we had a situation after the Selma movement in 1965 where the headhunters were coming into the South 
seeking to recruit what they consider to be promising African American academic prospects. And there was a push among my high school administrators to try to send many of us as possible to small white northern midwestern or midwestern institutions. Now this brainiac I competed with in class, we both was heavily in- recruited by Morehouse College in Tuskegee. Now, our administrators, counselors, did not want us to attend those historically black uh, colleges. They were determined to ship us off to some small, private, like I said, Northern or Midwestern University. I remember the name, but I'm not going to call any name because this presenter does not want to suggest that any taint should be associated with these schools. I'm sure they find colleges, wonderful colleges. So this doctor, after the Christmas break, Somewhere over, I would think, late February, early March, has not been admitted to a college or university yet. Now, this donkey was dating a young lady who actually grew up in a place called Madison, Georgia, about... 25 miles south of Athens, Georgia. But her mom and her stepfather lived across from street from me in Columbus, Georgia. Her mom was one of was my favorite elementary school teachers, so in around about her sixth and seventh grade year, she moved to Columbus. To make a long story short, she start, we started dating our senior year. So I, I wanted a scheme where I could still be in contact with her once I attended college. So I started thinking, because of that reason, University of Georgia, I can see her on the weekend. She can come up to Madison. But the second reason, I'm under pressure to go to a white University, but during that time, this doctor was deep in the athletics, was a sports fanatic, and I'm saying to myself, "Hey, if I'm going to a white university, it's going to be one that's in the SEC." Even though we didn't know back at, during that time, we didn't know anybody that played with the University of Georgia the SEC. We still had uh, buku respect. For the SEC, we knew the players. We knew who were the powerhouses. We knew who was winning. We knew who were lo- lo- who, was, who the losers. And even though this presenter, this doctor, has traveled miles and miles in the inner world, inner explorations, since those days, I still have a peace of the love for the Georgia Bulldog football team even to this day. I try to shun it, stay away from it, don't have a lot of time for it, but I admit that germ is still there to a certain extent after all these years. So, but I'm running late. I haven't even applied to the University of Georgia. Don't talk to any counselors. Don't talk to parents. Get together and and write a letter to the University of Georgia. 
and I tell them, look, I applied for admission a few months ago, and I haven't heard anything from the admission office. And I said, I believe that you're demonst- discriminating against me by failing to admit. Now, look, at this time, I'm not a race man. I'm not a Hamilton Holmes. I'm not a Charlene Hunter. The first two African Americans to integrate the University of Georgia. Let's not play any game. I'm just a scheming young brother, won't attend a SEC university, and, 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 and fantasizing about not having to quit my woman when I go to school because she'll be visiting me twice a month up near Athens. That's all I am. Let's not play games. Let's not jump into a trick bag and try to be all this or that. So I sent the letter off. This is a true story. Within two or three weeks, it appears to me, I went out to the mailbox. You see the University of Georgia colors. I see a, a, a letter with red and black stripe across the top. I crack it open. I've been admitted to the University of Georgia. No scholarship, no nothing. My daddy uh, was a veteran, so I qualified for VA uh, benefits. Now, at the time, it was very inexpensive to attend the University of Georgia. Very, very inexpensive. So I shot up there. Could pay for my dorm and my tuition, but not the food. So one day, this donkey was in the uh, pool room in the rec area at the University of Georgia. And I saw a big fella by the name of Walter Washington Green. At the time, I didn't know that his father, the late Mr. Donnerill Green Sr., may God have mercy upon Dr. Green, was the only African-American medical professional as far as doctor in Athens, Georgia. So one day he took me home, and his mama offered me a meal. What she wanted to do that for, I wrote that meal out. A few days later, he went over to his daddy's office to try to get some money from his daddy. And old Doc Green, he saw me, he said, Oh, it just watch. He said, hey, this is a fellow from Columbia, Georgia. He's a student at the University of Georgia. And old Doc Green, he was a race man. He had attended Meharry, uh University Mayor School in, I think it's Nashville, Tennessee. He was a race man. Matter of fact, he named Wash, I call him Wash, after Walter Washington uh, big political leader in Washington, D.C. So Doc told him, said, look, don't you let that boy miss a meal. So don't let, let him miss a meal. You feed him every day. And you tell your mama, I said, feed him every day. So that's how this donkey got his meal ticket. I went through that because I started as a donkey on a good friend named Walter. And my journey at the University of Georgia ended with another fella fella named Walter. In between, after a semester 
partying with Wash and his older brother. They graduated in 65. They were year older than me. And all our Athens homeboy, I can call their own their names. I'm a student at the University of Georgia. This ducky didn't have any business even going into the streets of Athens. But I had a local Athens posse. And I became tight with Wash. And so I was tight with all of his boys. So that first semester... That first quarter, University of Georgia, from the fall of 66 to the end, this doctor was in the old high school bag of partying, drinking, without any light of consciousness. But when he came back in 1967, in this same Room, he met one Lena Lasseter, a PhD student in sociology, a former uh, all conference basketball player at Pope Palace State. He too was at Athens. Wash was about six. Four, 265, but this fella, basketball player, now he dissipating with beer and not watching what he eat. So he comes back to Athens, he's about six, five and a half, but he blows up over 300. Within two months, we have this of quarters in Athens sitting behind some people we come to know as SDS people. And we started banging down, chugger looking down that old picture beer thing. And one of these Caucasians strike up a conversation and they tell us about SDS. For the first time, the light of political consciousness is turned on. Within the week, I become the high priest, priest of blackness at the University of Georgia, and this big fella becomes the enforcer. This is 1967. Also, we have an organizer from Atlanta. I'm not going to call her name. Became nationally known as a journalist. Also, as an outstanding novelist, I will not call her name. She's still living. She became the high priestess of our Black Student Union. And finally, we had uh, a theoretician who was working on a Ph.D. in history at the University of Georgia who went on to talk uh, at Morehouse College for over three decades. And in 1967... Big boy and I almost dropped out of school because there was a conflict in a place called Social Circle, Georgia. And we used to leave Athens every morning and drive down to Social Circle. And we became very, very tight. We became very, very tight. And we were looked upon as a troublesome combination. And we began to dominate the black affairs on the University of Georgia campus as well as in the city. 
this state of affairs went on until we took over some academic buildings and we coerced the University of Georgia into instituting a black studies program. Now the consciousness is turned on to the light of Africanness. And as we approach 1959, 69, there's a terrible schism in the Black Student Union at the University of Georgia. Now, and that split was between myself and then Forza, we grew into a relationship that was almost fraternal. I can see riding across the state line on Bulldog game day early in the morning because the Athens was dry. They didn't sell liquor. And we would go up there, get liquor, come back, with that schoolboy scotch, that Thunderbird wine, and we would, he would be driving, and we would be dr- singing, drinking wine, sporty yoda drinking wine. But he was very, very dangerous when he had taken in too much alcohol. And he became a very destructive force of nature, and even I had to watch him very, very carefully, had to watch him very, very carefully. For example, give you three examples. One night, a young man from my hometown, and I was riding around the University of Georgia campus with him and we thought we saw a big white fella make a derogatory remark so we got out the car he couldn't park so he rolled around the block and me and this other young brother we ran we took off full speed running hard and we hit this big Caucasian in the chest with an elbow, full speed. He took his arm. We were right above Stickman Hall. For those who know about old Stickman Hall, it was it was a little hill or incline leading down to it. And this fellow took his arm and just knocked us down like we were bowling pins. we get back up and try it again. He'd knock us down again. So my brother was with me. He told me, he, he showed it. I was going to say what he said. He said, this crack are hard as a rock, man. And he was right. So... By that time, Pi had come back around. He saw what, what, what was happening. But he's full of that chump oil now. And he's dangerous now. He's a dangerous whirlwind now. And you better look out. He jumped out that car, grabbed that fellow, and just chunked him down the hill as if he wasn't nothing. So we got back in the vehicle, started clowning again. Another example is when we had this friendly but very, very destructive 
fight with the University of Georgia football team. Now, when I, I tell people about this, they think the presenter, that means that we had a problem with Georgia. But no, even, even though we would go to the game and protest because our best duty was not playing in the African-American player, you better not say nothing about those Georgia Bulldogs. I'm going to just tell the truth. So when I convey this, do not think that it was with some kind of hatred for the Bulldog. No. This was the crazy 60s. Man, you know, they had this guy, uh, Bill Stanfield, playing for him, played NFL, Jake the Snake Scott. Man, I used to party with some of those SDS people. Some of the women used to dig on uh, uh, Jake Scott. For some reason, they loved Jake Scott. Jim Joy, Pat, and all those fellas. So, they didn't have no problem with them. They set up their spot in the bulldog room, and we had our spot. But on this particular day, the high priestess of soul transgressed the boundaries, or she instigated us to transgress the boundaries. She went back in the workers' area and saw that there was still Jim Crow bathroom facilities for the workers who work back in in that little cafeteria in the bulldog room. And so she came out instigating. We over there playing card, bid, whist, and, and, and spade and all that kind of thing. And she started running old Atlanta slick talking mouth telling her about how do you know these white folks still got segregated bathrooms. When she said that, it didn't take much for me to jump up and say, well, ain't another person going to eat in here until they take those signs down. So we up the ante. Big watch, get on one end of the, where there's one cash register, and, and the enforcer get on the other end. Now, that's, that's transgressing the bound because, look, one of those bulldogs may want to want to go up there and get a sandwich or whatever, and we blocking the line. Okay, no, you can't buy nothing. So they need to join the bulldogs so you know they're they going to get upset with that. But one of them was unwise. He should have proved Washes in. Wash was a teddy bear, but if you get him right, if you if you aggravate him too much, he could take care of a little business. But that it was a little business compared to this black tornado. So I'm sitting there, standing in the middle, running my mouth, not holding on a cash register, nothing. I ain't about to tangle with no bulldog. I'm behind it with you, no. But I'm steady running that old, that old, that old talk down. So this guy, I remember, and I know he played tight end. I, I'm going to call his name. His name was Billy Bryce. Billy Bryce comes up to his pie and try to get him to move. And he tap slap pie. Slap the enforcer. I hate to admit it, but I think he took Big Bernard for a minute. And he cap slapped him again. I saw him slap tap him again. Then I looked over there at Big Bernard. I said, you going to let that old cracker slap you, man? And he tap slapped him again. And what he want to do that for? Pie grabbed him and pumped him a couple of times and just chunked him. Then all hell broke loose in the bulldog room. The next day we act like it, nothing had happened. None of us had. We were, we were very so-called militant, dearly beloved audience. 
and we had nothing, absolutely nothing, against the Bulldogs. We cheered them on. The final example, one night we were up in the black house. Then poor says, old lady, we party, and she come to a party late. And at the black house, you had to walk up a long driveway. And she came, claimed that when she came up the driveway, some Caucasians assaulted her. We in the black house, we just jamming. We done put uh, some of that old ripple in a big old tub and mixed it with some great alcohol. Done smoked a couple of joints. We ain't feeling nothing. And we were ready to tell her to rock and roll. So she comes up there exaggerating, talking about how they, how they folk were messing with her. What she want to do that for? Big boy almost tore the door up getting out of there and put on his basketball trot and run, ran down to this house at the edge of the driveway. And Lord have mercy, big boy went in there and he worked out. That night, but Big Boy was arrested. And when they had his little misdemeanor trial, they had a, there was a, a Caucasian that was a Vietnam veteran. And he looked at the judge. These are the exact words. He said, I've been to Vietnam, Your Honor, and I've been to other places. But I ain't never seen Nobody fight, I'm not going to say what he said, like that N-word over there, pointing that big boy. I ain't never seen it. But big boy and I fell out in 1969 because big boy abuse his power. We had an arrangement for three years where we could go out to Watkinsville or to Whitehall, Georgia, get with our Caucasian brethren and smoke as much dope as we wanted to smoke free. One night, one of them brought some dope. His name was Dan. I give you his name up to the back house, I mean, the young brother who ran and hit that Caucasian and big boy, but he had a football player that was crazier than him with him by the name of Bulldog. Bulldog was a thug out of Detroit. So when Dan gave us a few joints, big boy and, 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 Bulldog took the man door and they threw him in some bushes and Big Boy, I mean Dan was in the bushes crying my name. Joe, Joe, please help me. Now this is a white boy. I knew and I knew the brother with me couldn't, even though we were not afraid of him, but we knew we couldn't whip Big Boy And bulldog. So I went over to him and I started talking that old, that old wolf, wolf, ugly talk. They started laughing, got in their car and knocked on about. That way, uh, Dan couldn't go back and tell his friends that Joe let the folk jump on him and then try to defend him. So that was the beginning of a breach with Big Boy. I started keeping my eye on him. And one uh, one day up at the black 
house again, partying. And I'm, uh, I live in the black house, big boy Dutton. Our roommate, who was a, one of the, I'm not going to call his name because he ended up in a great big legal position in the state of Georgia. But this fella come in there one night with a white date. He doesn't party with us. He, not, he doesn't run with us. He's not in the Black Student Union. He's a civilian, as far as I'm concerned. And I didn't care who he was dating because at the time, everybody used to say about Joseph, say, hey, Joseph, I have sex with a snake. If you hear his head down, black, white, polka dot, it didn't mean nothing to me. But Pi, big boy, was known as a quarterback. That meant that he talked black at night, at during the day, and at night he would go passing over with Caucasian females. We all knew this. So when he jumped ugly with this brother, snatched his Malcolm X poster off the wall, and then took his little box, that's what we played the records on, and stormed out the house. I cursed him. And he came back in trying to chase me down, stepped on the back steps, and they collapsed, and the wood stuck a big hole in his leg. And then finally... We were at a party, and he wanted this lady, but she didn't want him, so he tried to use political objections, but really he was rejected, and he didn't like it. So he got on about having unnatural hair, by, by having what he called fried hair. And so he pulled Bill in the young lady's head. She was a civilian. Her mom and dad had sent her to the University of Georgia to get an education. They hadn't sent her up there to be intimidated by a bunch of nuts like us. Didn't care nothing about nothing. So the guy who owned the, uh, the apartment named T-Bone, he came up there and got on Big boy, big boy slapped him. And I told T-Bone, man, go get your, he, he didn't have nothing but a twenty two. And he came back out of the back room brandishing his twenty two. So big boy left the house. I told T-Bone, let's go get him. So we are in the parking lot. And T-Bone grew up with big boy, so he don't want to kill him. But I'm still telling him to blast him, blast him. Every time I tell him that, T-Bone shoot up in the air. So big boy leaves. Next time he see me, he doesn't try to get no get back. But we knew and I knew that our partnership was forever severed. In 69, we go up to Greensboro, North Carolina. He goes in a different car. I see him up there. We had what's called a Cebu Conference. Cleveland Seller, uh, Stokely Carmichael's, Brother in action with Black Power during the Mavis March in Greenville, uh, not Greenville, but uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. He's a guest presenter. There's a delegation of brothers from Buffalo that is that scrapped to the hill, guns everywhere. Big boy over there with him trying to play bad. He looked over at me 
and I shook my head. But now I'm thinking, Buffalo, big boy and experience what this presenter experienced in early 1969. We coming up to 50 years later. Trying to tell you how this dark eyes began to come open. It was some people from Buffalo and SDS, some twin brothers and a couple, and they turned this presenter on to SDS. Yeah, I tripped. But I didn't realize at the time that it had opened up some kind of way the light of spiritual consciousness for the first time. And see, I've studied Big Boy's life. Big Boy never got beyond black consciousness. The spiritual eye never opened in Big Boy. And when I went to Big Boy's funeral, I, I had to give a eulogy that was on my mind. He blew all the way for the rest of his life. Brilliant PhD student. Never completed his doctorate. Never got himself together again. End up a everyday insurance salesman. So, in 69, I made the first move as a ducky from the light of black consciousness to the light of some other kind of consciousness, uh, some kind of pseudo-spiritual consciousness. And from 1969 to the end of the Battle of Athens in May 1970, that mind was still that crack in the cosmic egg was still kicking. And that Spring of 1970, the same spring of Kent State, Athens, Georgia, blew up. Whole scale insurrection by African American high students, African American students, University of Georgia, and Caucasian students, even the fat and sorority types. We all came together. During that movement, which I call the Battle of Athens, the last real civil rights movement in the South, May of 1970, I ran with a brother by the name of Walter Moore. Didn't make the connection. But there was a direct logical evolutionary development from Walter Green to four years later, Walter Moore. That was a prescient signal that one day I would take on the consciousness of the Moors. Walter Farmer, Walter is, is Wally. Look it up, Wally, W-A-L-L-Y. Is a form of Wallace and Walter. So, back then, even with those Walters, there was some kind of omen 
that one day the consciousness would be brought to complete, complete light by Wally. 1971, get ready to leave Athens, marry, graduate. My younger brother Michael comes to the graduation, which I don't attend. We I go over there and pick up my papers. Then we go and get titles of drawn. But he had a brother with him by the name of Billy Ray. Billy Ray's mom was my mother's best friend. Her name was Miss Lucille. But we call him Khufu. This is 1971. I had no idea that two years later in 1973 that this same younger brother of mine would introduce me to the light of esoterica. And much of that light comes out of ancient Egypt. That's why this fellow was named Khufu. This is how the creator was gradually opening the eyes of this donkey. And then, two years after 1973, in 1975, I'm home and I see Kufu's brother, Walter Bernard. And he's a member of the Nation of Islam. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has passed away. He has a newspaper. I buy it because I'm proud of him. I remember my mama, uh, best friend's son, I remember when he was a little boy up under me. So he dressed sharp, got on his bow tie and stuff, looking all good, looking all neat. And he come up to me and said, Joe, you want to buy a paper? Yeah, I bought two papers. But it was not the message of the nation of Islam. This was the spring of 75, some eight years after the spring of 67, where within this paper, I read Imam Wali or Wallace Muhammad bought the paper from Walter or Wally. Walter Wash Green, Walter Moore, and Walter Bernard Harrington. Now the doctor has seen the light. And I'm walking around Atlanta looking, moved to Atlanta. A few months later, walking around Atlanta, getting ready to buy me some newspapers, studying the religion of Islam. And I run across this brother, Athens. A guy that even Big Boy was afraid of. Because this brother was known as the first brother to pick up a gun in the Keynesian Civil Rights Movement. Not led by Robert Williams out of North Carolina. In the Albany Movement. And he was from Athens. And we used to go to a juke joint juke joint called the house of blue light house of blue lights only this brother his nephew big boy and myself could sit at the front table 
Now, big boy and this brother, they have both passed away. I am not going to call the name of this brother because if I did, it would give away the identity of his nephew. His nephew is still alive, and I don't want to talk about him. I don't want to talk about him. All I can say is that he grew into a dangerous man, and I'm going to leave it at that. But this fella, he saw me, and he looked as if he'd seen a ghost. He said, Joe, why are you looking so young? And so clean. I told him, brother, you know it. I said, I'm a Muslim now. This is that old Muslim look, brother. So said, well, what you doing? I said, man, I just finished law school. And when I told him that, oh, he just lit up. Which was to say, man, I didn't get nothing out the system. But you used to be with us. And I'm glad to see that you were able to get some out the system. I know we'll forget that look of joy in his face. He up there walking around now in the streets of Atlanta. Oh, off the Cascade area. About two miles down from where seeing. And I see the brother. I never see him again. Next thing I hear. He had gone home. He and Big Boy both. Now the nephew is always asking about me. I haven't seen him since I left Athens. It was out of that kind of turmoil, out of that kind of ignorance that the Creator brought me out of the depths of darkness and the light. I say to each each and every one of you under the sound of my voice that you too can be brought out of the depths of darkness into light. What's the difference between this presenter and big boy? Ego In order to grow, you must have a humble spirit. The book says hard, except for those who bring a lowly spirit. Or Jesus would say, you must come like a babe. Stop acting and thinking like you know everything. Stop thinking and acting like you know everything. Be willing to say, hey, there's so much I don't know, we, you could create a new world with it. And when this presenter in August of 75 heard the ma'am teach on that eye on the pyramid, that pyramid for over six hours, nonstop without notes, and every line was something new. Then I had to go back into the mother's womb. Dear beloved audience, be born again and come out as a babe in the light, in the cradle, hoping that one day the Creator would bless me with a transfiguration moment. Well, I'm lifting a man of knowledge up, ascending on the Mount of Light, He's ascending and I'm lifting him up. Then maybe the Creator will, will lift me up. I lift him up. And when Jesus came down off that mountain, he was lit with light. But he started off as a baby, baby in darkness in the cradle. Jesus, when he first started, was not right. He was when he went up on the mountain. 
mountain? Can I prove it? Yes. Did he baptize John the Baptist? Or did John the Baptist baptize him? He came up under John the Baptist, even though John the Baptist knew he had a greater destiny. He can't, he's not even worthy to lace, lace up his shoes. But Jesus was humble enough to let to acknowledge John the Baptist's spiritual edge over him. Was, okay, so you baptize, baptize me. But in time, Jesus surpassed John the Baptist because he had the signs. John the Baptist was a prophet of the heart. So he said his head was cut off, not physically. He didn't have the logic. The signs in the great dean, the way Jesus had. Jesus had the great light, the great signs. John the Baptist had good, clean, Adamic sentiments, sensibilities, sensitivities about God and religion. Everything is real on this battlefield. Dearly beloved audience, go back and find you a student from the 60s. Go back and find you a law student. Go back and find you a, a law professor. And let them give you a narrative like this presenter just gave you. That's why this presenter is so thankful. This is Thanksgiving. All that cool boy scotch we were drinking. This was a big man I'm running with. I'm five, eight, hundred forty pounds. Every time he took a drink, I took one. Our mind should have been pickled out for three or four years. They are they giving us these little Agent provocateurs acting like they have a friend, giving a dope. Some of these fellas took a toe one night. I knew it. I, I started cursing to myself. This end done gave me some bad dope. And he's sitting there looking like he's laughing. I wonder who I paid him to try to get him to blow my mind. But the creator wasn't having that. The creator allowed this 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 donkey to maneuver until he could have way to get his bearing back. Took me a few months. I had to overcome all kind of paranoia. This chump then gave me some bad dope. And I know his name, he's older than me. Came out of the movement, ran with my, and he came up to ask another provocateur aiming to get this duck out. Giving me some lace dope. <laughs> Trying to run me crazy. <laughs> and that, that tote did, that hit did. Blow my mind for a hot minute, about three, four months. If I hadn't met my wife and started running with her, I'd have been up the creek. Dearly beloved audience, you're listening to the... Look, the Creator helps you by first getting you back in touch with the yin and your own nature. Because when you get out there all strung out and crazy, you're over the yang. Ain't none of that yin in your nature kicking in. So me, 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 my soulmate was a sign of the reawakening of the yin. 
first thing she started doing was appealing to the moral standards that my mama had given me, that my grandmama had given me, challenging me about all this crazy behavior. And I was still a rope doping trying to get back. So I couldn't argue with her too much. But all that was part of it couldn't come into the great light until I got back in touch with the inner yin in my own soul. Dearly beloved audience, you're listening to the miracle of a donkey speaking with a man's voice. Yesterday, November the 19th, I talked about my grandmother, November the 15th, and today, November the 20th, 19th was the day of the passing of my father, two years after my grandmother, 1979, and the 20th was the passing, November the 20th, of his baby sister, he was named Joe, and Joe's a and she was named Josephine. That's the one whose son was named Wallace, who used to always cut into me with that talk about how he could whip the average man. I was going to say some things about that, but we're going to move on. They put a good brother away that was about three years older than me, graduated in 63. I got out of there in 66. And in 67, after we made that conversion to black consciousness, he came down to Columbus. He was living in Chicago and he gave me a ride back to live with one of our friends and work that summer. But we used to see each other all the time. He was married so long and he worked at U.S. Steel. This guy's name was Roy Hollis. And Roy was the first person who allowed me to share light with him. He may have been aggravated because I I, I kept in his ear with all that old black power talk. And all he would do was just laugh and say, run it down, run it down, just run run that old righteous thing down, and I would run it down. But Roy became a man before my eyes one one day. Before then, Roy had a little coward in him. But I saw Roy become a man right before my eyes. Roy got in a fight on the practice field with a guy named, we call him Charlie the Horse McGee. Charlie the Horse M- McGee was an all-around athlete, but he could run faster in a football uniform than he could in a track uniform, even though he was fast. Now, there was that Carver High School, you check things out. He will forever be an archetype of a running back out of Carver Columbus. Now, Carver Columbus had a coach named Dale McGee, and Dale McGee produced a lot of running backs at Carver High. Isaiah Isaiah Cole being one. Now, Dale McGee is a running back coach at the University of Georgia. And he recruit very good at recruiting. 
two running backs. But I wonder sometimes whether Dale McGee is familiar with the original running back at Carver High, Charlie the Horse McGee. See, that's how life is. It's a design. And I remember seeing Charlie the Horse, Horse McGee's son at a funeral of a friend of mine in Columbus. And somebody told me, hey, man, that's Charlie McGee, boy, is there, boy. And I looked at him, and I started telling him about his father. And he just lit up, almost tears came in his eyes. And he said, if my daddy do all that, I said, yeah, man, your daddy was one of the baddest running backs ever hit Columbus, Georgia. Charlie the Horse McGee. But Charlie was somewhat of a bully because he was older. He was about he stayed back about two, three times at least. So he was older than Roy. So Roy was scared of him. So they got to fighting on the football field and the coach sent him up to the dressing room. This presenter was in there messing around. They got back up, getting ready to take a shower. Charlie said something to Roy. Roy said saying, saying something back. Now they standing up in their jockey scraps and they go, go to Roy again. But see, Roy now he's six three by two forty. Charlie may be about 5'10", 170, 165, 170. And Roy get Charlie down, and he presses all that weight on Charlie. And Charlie couldn't move. And I'm sitting there shocked. Charlie, the horse McGee, he giving but he started cussing Roy to save face. So Roy let him up. But after that, Roy walked like a man. Roy talked about, talked like a man. I saw him grow up right before my eyes. And he knew I saw him. And when I came to Chicago, the summer of 67, Roy treated me like a kid brother. But we put Roy away this weekend. And I have to remember Roy. Dearly beloved audience, you're listening to the miracle of a donkey speaking with a man's voice. Can I take my time? You see how the Creator is touching me? How I'm laying this out? There's no exaggeration. I've given you the narrative, dearly beloved audience, how the Creator systematically opened the eyes of this donkey. And so now you can witness the miracle of a donkey speaking with a man's voice. Well, brother, I don't believe you were like that at the University of Georgia. And now you're trying to live a life of cosmic compliance. It's the grace and mercy of our Lord that we acknowledge. We say, Allahu Akbar, God is greater. Big boy and I and the others, we have problems. I have problems. 
but the creator was bigger than those problems. So the creator who's bigger than those problems, who's greater than anything that we can imagine, bestowed his grace and helped me remove some of those problems. But some this doctor would take to the grave. We say, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Creator. We're not trying to impress you. We're not trying to boast to you. We're trying to encourage you as a son and daughter of Adam to claim your legacy. Lost, the lost property of the son and daughter of Adam is knowledge. Is knowledge. We're going to go ahead and get started. Is the West worth saving? Let us listen to the rapping of the raven. I need to ask something. Is the West worth saving? Let's listen to the rapping and tapping of the raven. Dearly beloved audience, we're going to take you through something beginning the night and Thursday night. You may be enjoying your family. Go right ahead. I'm going to be enjoying my family. But hopefully at 9 o'clock Thursday night, we got to tee this thing up again. And all that we, dearly beloved audience, do not cover tonight and Thanksgiving will continue on Tuesday. If you notice, listen, I'm talking about the Ravens. Now, we know in the world of sports, there is a NFL football team, the Baltimore Ravens. Keep that in mind. And also remember, sports imitate life, and life imitates sports. Art imitates life, and life imitates art. Okay? Just that simple. This rape, well, this is what, do you know, now, we're going to have to really disciple some things with this. Is the West worth saving from what? The judgment of God. Can the West that's obsessed with global materialism resulting from a physicalization of God through the misdirection of St. Paul when he gave us the idea that Jesus should be deified. And then we had the churches putting this deified human-like figure in the image of a European on the cross. And if you have a flesh-based carnal God, then your systemic paradigm will eventually evolve into materialism. In flesh material, in matter material, Oh, yes, in this fall, 2018, leading up to the armistice, which marked the end of World War One, And World War One was the beginning of a series of global events which led to the destruction of white supremacy. 
while it's still here, yeah, but it's on his deathbed. You hear the chain stoking and the death rattle. But oh yes, it's on his deathbed. So they, they, they talk about this armistice. The power in the West was not with its military weapons, its military arms. The power in the West was the fact that it could arm itself to fight psychological warfare with the scheme of ISIS that came out of ancient Egypt. I-S, I-S. That should be is, is. But they pronounce it ISIS. So the word ice refers to a religious system which takes away the warm-bloodedness of social justice and consciousness. And people followed then a cold-blooded doctrine where they don't treat each other justly, but they talk about love all the time. Love you this, love you that. But the heart is cold as ice. That's ISIS a religious doctrine that takes away the warm blood of pair of human relations. So, during this time of the 100th anniversary of the armistice, we have signs of judgment in the East, Hurricane Michael and Hurricane Florence, they come together. Florence means Florida. Florence came, and then Michael came to Florida. Oh, yes. See, if you study these things, you can see an interconnected pattern. And when you see an interconnected pattern, you see a design. When you see a design, you know that there must be a plan or consciousness behind that design. Out west, the judgment is fire, not against white folk, not as against this conservative guy said, against liberals. No judgment on this world of materialism. The conservative are the Magog. The so-called liberals are the God. And the book says that we would have to take a look at the God and the Magog according to revelations in this day and time. So the judgment is on everybody. The God in the Magog. The so called liberals and the progressives and the so called conservatives. Well, why do I call so called? Because they are not inclined to conserve the will of the Creator. They are inclined to con people into serving them. Being the masters over folk. That's the conservative. The liberals are not this, uh, 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 so much in the, having a broad, extended mind, broad horizons. No, many times it regresses into a state of, of uh, libertine, reluctant to enforce any moral or spiritual constraints. Be free. Let everything hang out. There's nothing wrong with being a liberal. Y'all call me a liberal. I want a broad mind. 
There's nothing wrong with being a conservative in the natural sense. Yes, I want to conserve the cosmic world of creator. But when that liberalism becomes artificial, then that's devolving into a state of being a member of the party of the Gog. And when that Magog is utilized to try to conserve white supremacy and the dominance of the white race over other races, then that's the Magog. But out west, where did they say this fire was initiated? Where they said it initiated was started on November the 8th. Let's just do our math. November's the 11th month. Bam. The 8th. Eight and eleven is nineteen. Nineteen and one, and I mean nineteen. Well, eleven is two. One and one is two. So eleven, and then and then we what did what did we say eight? So uh, eleven and eight, as we said, was nineteen. I'm sorry. I'm, um, I'm repeating myself. And then you got 2018. 20 plus 18, that's 1 and 89, that's 2. So you got 19 and 2, that's 21. And 2 and 1 is 3. That's what's under the judgment. The offspring of materialism and a deified physical God is three and one. Materialism leads to Trinitarianism. Now, what time exactly did this fire start? They said 6 03 a.m. Let's do the math. Six plus three is nine. Is not nine three square? Three times three is nine. What does that mean? That the Trinity has maxed out. And it's going to be proven in this day and time. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's what Jesus taught. He said, I came not to destroy the law. The law of what? Oneness. All the prophets have taught a doctrine called Tawhid which means oneness of God. That's the first law. To love Almighty God, the one God. So, whatever happened with that power, it came to bring an end to the situation where the law of the paradise has been violated for hundreds of years and humankind has been brought into a state of hell. Did not Jacob dream at Bethel, B-E-T, that he could create hell? That he could envision it? Do not they have us greeting each other in this day of judgment? Hello? And not the peace that Jesus taught us to greet each other with, that Moses taught us to greet each other with, that Muhammad taught us, uh, to greet each other, hello, go to hell. But they say it broke out near a dam called Poe. P O E. Now it's getting interesting. Is the rest worth saving? Let's listen to the rapping and tapping of the raven. 
make the connection. Pull. Just think about on the level of Western knowledge lore. When you say pull, what's the first thing that come to your mind? P.O.E.? I had never heard of P.O.E. in the context of anything other than the poet, Edgar Allen Poe, who, like the Ravens, did a lot of operating in Baltimore. Art imitates life, and sports imitates life. And what point that Poe is noted for? The Raven? The Raven. I repeat, is the worst worth saving. Let's listen to the rapping or the tapping of the race. If you read that poem, you see Paul constantly talk about this raven tapping. Of the human being. 
without the light of cosmic religious science. And so Satan can trick that first Adam, but he cannot trick that Adam that come under the light of cosmic religious science, that second Adam, that Adam that's a quickening spirit. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's the same doctor that was doing all that foolishness at the University of Georgia. Now, the creator has opened the eyes of this ducky, and now you're observing right before your eyes the miracle of a ducky speaking with a man's voice. Some of you, especially my African-American brothers and sisters, you always throughout my life been telling me, you can't tell me nothing about my Bible. I know my Bible. That's ego. If the Bible is the word of God, then the Creator owns that word, not you. So you're arrogant and insolent talking about your Bible. It's not your word. If it's the word of God, it's God's word. So you shouldn't be saying my Bible. I can't say my Quran. Physical is in my house. Physical, the Bible is in my house, but I don't own either one of them. But if you're getting ready to stake out an ego position, and you're not, and you don't want to seek truth, you don't want to seek, you don't want to knock, you don't want to find. You don't want to follow Jesus who said you should know the truth. So you get set in an argument. You're ready to debate. You're ready to talk about your Bible. I challenge all of you, especially my go to your preachers between now and Thanksgiving night. And you do your research, and you be ready to tell me what it means, what the story of Elijah means, and the fact that Elijah has been fed by the ravens. Why is that name spelled E L I J H? You're going to love this. Hundreds of Macy's Cyber Week specials are here and ready for gifting online and in store. Like boots and booties for her, buy one, get one free. Mixers, air fryers, and more, 20% plus an extra 20% off. And find gifts for him and her, coats, sweaters, tops, 50 to 60% off. Macy's Cyber Week specials now through Wednesday. Savings off regular prices, exclusions apply. Macy's Star Rewards now offers benefits everyone can enjoy no matter how they pay. Sign up for free in store or at Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. You're going to love this. Hundreds of Macy's Cyber Week specials are here and ready for gifting online and in store. Like boots and booties for her, buy one, get one free. Mixers, air fryers, and more, 20% plus an extra 20% off. And find gifts for him and her, coats, sweaters, tops, 50 to 60% off. Macy's Cyber Week specials now through Wednesday. Savings off regular prices, exclusions apply. Macy's Star Rewards now offers benefits everyone can enjoy no matter how they pay. Sign up for free in store or at Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. 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 